Thank you so much, Melissa, and thank you also everyone for giving me the chance to come and talk to the Winter School. Um, I hope you're having a really good week. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land um, on which we are having this lecture um, and acknowledge uh, leaders past, present and emerging. So I'm going to talk about modes of variability today. Um, and this is one of those topics where you go, oh yeah, modes of variability, that's like and so and MJO and SAM and all that stuff. And then you start thinking about it and go, yeah, actually, what, what is it? Like, how do we define what, what these modes of variability really are? So I'm going to start in this lecture by talking, about, taking a step back from the sort of modes of variability and just talk about variability by itself in time um, and then expand out a little bit to variability in space and time together. Um, I'm then going to talk a bit about climate indices, um, although not too much, um, and, then, and then hopefully finish with looking at how variability maps onto the weather um, and also what happens when we have multiple modes of variability happening at the same time. So one way of thinking about a mode of variability is something that we can notice. So something that humans have noticed uh, about the weather or climate varying on a particular time scale. And humans have obviously been doing this for hundreds, if not thousands or tens of thousands uh, of years. So here's one historic example. So Andean uh, potato uh, farmers or uh, people growing potato crops um, noticed that if the um, Pleiades constellation was difficult to see, uh, so it was obscured in, in the skies, um, then they should delay pan planting their potato crop until later in the season. Um, and so they attributed this to something to do with the, the stars influencing their crops. Um, but a later study uh, from uh, the last couple of decades followed up this um, system of crop planting and uh, found out that when we have El Nino conditions, um, then this uh, suggests more high cirrus clouds in this particular region, um, which would have obscured the um, stars, the star constellations. Um, and in, in this case, rain was more likely later in the season. So here's an example going back to 1532 of humans noticing some kind of seasonal variation in the uh, climate modes um, and using it to uh, um, modulate their growing season uh, um, uh, patterns, uh, which is actually something that we would like to do today too, right? Like we would like to know how to use climate indices to make useful forecasts of things like growing season uh, rainfall. Here's another example um, where the um, uh, harvesting of the um, guano uh, bird, bird droppings for, for fertilizers. This was a huge um, export uh, off the coast of South America and it was subject to periodic failures every few years where there were torrential rains that would kill the birds and wash all the, the bird droppings away from these, um, from, from these islands um, and uh, the, the whole industry would kind of collapse. And, and, and this, this came to be linked to the onset of El Nino and, and La Nina conditions, um, or, or onset of La Nina conditions, I should say, in the, sorry, El Nino conditions uh, in the uh, eastern Pacific Ocean. So I'm completely sure that there are numerous other examples all over the world of where people have noticed climate indices uh, before we've necessarily understood the physical atmospheric processes or ocean processes behind them driving the variability. So we could, we could just define our a climate mode as, as some, some sort of periodicity that we've noticed uh, in the weather or climate. One of the, one of the amazing and challenging things about the climate modes, though, is that we've got lots of variability going on on lots of scales at the same time. And when we look at our mean climate, it's some kind of non-linear composite of all of the modes of variability. So this is the mean outgoing long wave radiation across the globe from 1974 to 2022. And you can see it varies a lot in space, uh, but we don't see anything about how it varies in time um, on this particular plot. 
So just to, to note, when we look at OLR, the smaller values mean, mean cloudy conditions and the higher values mean less cloudy conditions. Um, and when we say it's a non-linear composite, that means that we're not just adding, so, so say we think of all the modes of variability as a wave, we're not just adding the waves together. So this is not the year 10 physics experiment where you send waves down the rope and you, you see the superposition of the waves. Well, there might be a bit of that going on, but the, the, the non-linear part is how would those waves actually influence each other's structure or the weather response to those waves. So if we drill down into any location on the globe uh, that's feeding into this mean uh, value, we can get some kind of time series, right? And so I've just taken two uh, interesting boxes here from the global OLR climate, um, and one of them is over the maritime continent, over here, over the deep tropics, and one of them is over Australia. And you can see the kind of time series uh, of OLR that we get uh, from these locations. Um, this is daily data, so we've got many scales of variability in the one time series. All right, so you can immediately see that there's an annual periodicity in both of these time series. That, that's, that's sort of obvious uh, up and down that you see uh, through the years, and that's the same at both locations. But you can also pick out lots of other time scales of variability. You can see sort of big areas where there's sort of slow dips uh, that last several years in the OLR. Um, and there's sort of groups that seem to go up and down in, in different places that your eye can pick out. So the question is, if we're going to try and attribute some of these modes of variability to climate modes, then what kind of techniques would, might we use and how could we make sense of those kind of variabilities and variations that we see in space and time? And you could put this box anywhere you like uh, on the planet and you would see different, different kind of timescales coming out in, in your variations. <clears throat> so the most obvious mode of variability is the annual cycle. It's not a very interesting one because we know exactly what the period is um, and it's, it, it's sort of always there. So we've got a period of 365, or I should say 365.25 uh, days, um, and it has an amplitude, and it has a phase, and it has a mean, right? And we can fit a harmonic like this to the data. And that will just give us something like the red curve here. We could also make an annual cycle just by taking the average value over every day of the year during the period. But for argument's sake, let's fit a harmonic to the annual cycle. And we can subtract that from our original time series. So now the time series, instead of fluctuating about uh, this annual cycle, it fluctuates about zero. And we can see that we still have a lot of variability left uh, in the time series once we remove that annual cycle. And I guess the question is, is this random or stochastic or can we attribute it to certain frequencies and how could we find that out? All right, so here's one answer and that is that we could fit a cosine function just like we did for the annual cycle to every possible frequency and find the amplitude at each frequency. And that is actually what we do when we take a Fourier transform and calculate a power spectrum of the data. We are just looking at the amplitude of every possible frequency that we could have in the data. So let's, let's do that for some of those time series. So here's our original time series, still with the annual cycle in it. And here is the power spectrum. Uh, so by taking the Fourier transform, which really, this just gives us the amplitude of the fluctuations at every possible frequency along the horizontal axis along here. And what we find when we um, uh, calculate this power spectral density of the time series is that we have these distinct peaks in the time series. Right? So here's our annual cycle at 365 days. Here's our semi-annual cycle at half of that, 182 days. And then we seem to have some kind of broad peak centred on around 40 days at this location, and we have other peaks at, in, in, this, in this location at 13 and 8 days. This power spectrum decomposes the variance in the time series according to its frequency, right? So the total area under the power spectrum is equal to the variance of the time series but the variance contains the variability from all different 
timescales uh, that we've put uh, in there. You can see there's a red and a black part to this spectrum. That's just because when we calculate the power spectrum of a very long time series, it gets very noisy at the highest frequencies. So if we chop our spectrum up into pieces and average, then we can get a much smoother spectrum to extract the peaks that we're really interested in. So I think another alternative definition, other than something that humans have noticed as a mode of variability in the weather and climate, we could also define a climate mode as a spectral peak uh, in time or in space and time. You can see here in this version of the spectrum, which is the one where we removed the annual harmonic, then we've got rid of this uh, annual peak in here, but everything else is completely unchanged because all the other frequencies are still exactly the same as they were uh, in the original time series. By the way, please stop me and ask any questions. If you have questions at any time, um, you can just wave your hand or call out or anything. All right. So calculating power spectrum, uh, spectra is a, uh, a pretty common way of analysing the variability in uh, weather and climate data sets. So on the left hand side here is the uh, power spectral density of the um, HAD ISST. Um, so this is the, the sea surface temperature over the Nino 3.4 region, which is in the eastern uh, Pacific Ocean. So this is one of our ENSO SST uh, regions. And you can see that this power spectrum has a broad peak between two and eight years. And so that's our ENSO scale variability coming out in the SSTs. It's not a really sharp, well-defined peak because ENSO is not like the annual cycle that happens sort of like clockwork once a year. It changes from year to year, right? So sometimes we get three, three La Niñas in a row, for example, and sometimes we change between La Niña and El Niño every year um, for, 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 for some small number of years. So it's sort of this broad peak that gets spread out in spectral space. But calculating the power spectra like this is sometimes used as a diagnostic for climate models uh, to see uh, when we run climate models forward into the future, how regularly are we changing between El Nino and La Nina. And so the, the, the characteristics of this spectral peak is a, one way of diagnosing the quality of an ENSO forecast uh, in, in model data. On the right hand side is a spectrum which is from some pretty old data now. Uh, this was from a paper in 1971 and it's the original paper by Madden and Julian uh, where they first uh, sort of defined the spectral characteristics of the Madden-Julian oscillation. And this power spectrum came from just a really simple daily time series, right? Like it wasn't any complicated spatial data at all. It was just one, I think, 10 year time series and they've again calculated the power spectral density. And they found something that they didn't expect. They found this broad spectral peak uh, between about um, 30 and 90 days in here. And they wrote in their paper that the strength of the evidence for this oscillation came as a distinct surprise. We must, ever, we must emphasize that we had no reason whatsoever to suspect that such an oscillation might exist. Right, it would be really cool to be able to write something like that in your paper, right? <laughs> Um, right, so, so in this case, I mean, I think there, m there might be some evidence that, that people could, had some, had, could observe the MJO, in, you know, just from looking at the weather, but it's a more obscure kind of thing, and it really didn't come out until people started viewing it, viewing the data in spectral space. Now, this one is just from one location, so we, this is nothing to do with the movement of systems, this is just standing here as a system moves past you and, and looking at how things fluctuate. All right, so the thing is that some aspects of the weather and climate system vary mostly in space. Uh, is it, they, they don't propagate, right? So they're, they're, they're locked to one particular location. And ENSO is a good example of this. So you can see on the right-hand side, uh, these are monthly sea surface temperature anomalies of the HAD ISST in the Pacific Ocean. And so ENSO we know is kind of locked into that location of the Pacific Ocean and sort of focused on, on the, the sea surface temperatures in the Eastern Pacific. And then we have things like uh, the Madden-Julian Oscillation, which is propagating, right? It's, it's, it's moving. So it's got variation in space and time. 
And I guess the real complexity of this is that we, when we think about things that are propagating, moving into regions of variability which is more locked in space and time. So a good example is when the MJO moves into the region that's influenced uh, by ENSO and then we have an interaction between these two uh, modes of variability which each have their own characteristics in space and time. So what, if, if we're looking at something that moves in space and time, we're not going to fully capture it if we just look at time series, right? Because it's, we've got to capture the movement of the system as well. And so the way that we often end up looking at things in space and time uh, is by using a Hofmüller plot. And I think you're all probably familiar with Hofmüller plots. Uh, but for, for anyone who's not, we've got longitude along the horizontal axis here. So this is right around the globe from 0 to 360 degrees. And we've got time on the vertical axis. And this is looking at outgoing long wave radiation uh, anomalies. And, and, and outgoing long wave radiation is like cloudiness. So green is cloudy and brown is, or green is more cloudy and brown is less cloudy uh, in this particular plot. And so what we can see, and this is for a um, band along the tropics, what we can see is that there's all these kind of streaks in the Hofmüller plot. And that actually means that things are moving, right? If we have this disturbance that's over here on the um, 15th of April, and then we find it down here um, towards the end of May, then we can see that it's moved a distance of about 200 degrees in longitude space uh, during uh, this particular time series. And so the slope of these lines on the Hofmüller plot gives us the propagation speed, so how, how fast it's moving in the, in the zonal direction. All right, so if we look at this, this big sort of green streak that's going down here, and we calculate its propagation speed, um, 200 degrees longitude in about 40 days gives us a propagation speed of something like 8 metres per second, which is in the range of propagation speeds that we would see for the MJO, the Madden-Julian Oscillation, which we've just talked about, which was that uh, phenomenon that was discovered uh, through the spectral analysis. But what we can see here is that there's actually numerous eastward and westward propagating disturbances. In fact, most of the variability in this tropical region can be attributed to some kind of moving disturbance uh, propagating eastward or westward. And we can see they've got different propagation speeds. So this little one down here is propagating faster. And then we've got something here which is propagating the other direction. So that's propagating towards the uh, west. So what are these other um, phenomena that we see in the tropics, that this sort of soup of modes propagating eastwards and westwards that's making up our overall variability uh, in, the, in the tropics? So just like we calculated a power spectrum in time, we can calculate a power spectrum in two dimensions. We could do it in two dimensions in space, but we can also do it in two dimensions where the two dimensions are space and time. And so this is a power spectrum calculated in space and time, and I've taken this from a Collada L 2009 paper, and they've removed some background They've removed a background spectrum from this. So this is a sort of anomaly uh, of the spectrum. And what we can see is that there's really clear peaks in space-time spectral space. All right, so let's unpack this a little bit. Along the horizontal axis, we have zonal wave number. So this is the spatial scale of the phenomena. And zonal wave number, so like, is, is how many wavelengths do we fit in an Earth circumference, right? So zero up to, so this is five, five waves around an Earth circumference gives us our zonal wave number. So it's basically just the, the size of the disturbance. We could convert that into kilometres if we, if we just scaled it by the, the circumference of the Earth. On the vertical axis, we have the period in days or the frequency in cycles per day, right? So this is the time scale of the disturbance. So at any given location, we can see that we have a size of the disturbance or a spatial scale of the disturbance and we have a frequency of the disturbance, how much it's going up and down. All right, now we know that frequency and wave number 
are related uh, to the propagation speed of a wave by um, c, the speed, equals the frequency times the wavelength. So if we know a wave number or a, a wavelength and a frequency, we can also calculate a propagation speed. Right? So each of these um, uh, uh, disturbances on here has a specific propagation speed that we can read off the space-time spectrum. So it turns out that each of these sort of blobs of spectral energy on here can be related to one of these typical propagation speeds that we see when we plot a Hovmoller diagram of uh, cloudiness in the tropics. We can also use this space-time spectrum as a filter to extract just the modes of variability that we're interested in. So if we take a Fourier transform in space-time of all of our, um, of, of lots of our data, and then we throw away all the, co the Fourier coefficients except for the ones that we're interested in, so say we take our Fourier transform and then we throw away all the Fourier coefficients except for, say, the ones that cover this little box of the MJO, and then we inverse Fourier transform again, then the bit that we get left is just our MJO scale variability. And that's what these smooth curves here are showing on the Hovmoller plot, which is pulling out in a very smooth way just the MJO scale, the MJO contribution to the variability on the Hovmoller plot. And we can do that for all the other types of uh, variabilities we see in the space-time spectrum as well. So these little blue ones here uh, relate to this section of the space-time spectrum, and these black ones here relate to this section of the spectrum. Now you'll see that these ones are propagating in the opposite direction to the MJO. So the MJO is propagating towards the east, and these ones, which we call Equatorio Rosby waves, are propagating towards the west. So what exactly are they? These are all examples of equatorially trapped waves that correspond closely to the dry solutions to the shallow water equations on an equatorial beta plane. This is work that was first explained by Matsuno in 1966. And so the solutions, so, so when, we, when we constrain these solutions with the boundary conditions that they decay away from the equator and we assume a wave-like solution, then the solutions give us a set, a family of two-dimensional waves constrained by the relationship between the wave number, k, that's here, and the frequency, w, which is the, the temporal scale. So that k and w are the k and w off the axis of this plot here. And we have solutions for a set of n integer values. And so this gives us what's called a dispersion relation. It gives us the, it constrains the frequency for a given wave number, and it therefore also constrains the propagation speed of a certain type of wave. So these lines on this plot here, these uh, black lines, which don't come from the data, these are theoretical lines, these are the dispersion relations that come from the Matsuno 1966 uh, equations for different, um, for different values of n, so different values of this n in here, and for different equivalent depths of the shallow water equations. So when we, when, we, when we set up the shallow water equations, we have to assume a depth of the fluid. We don't exactly know what it should be. Um, but when we try different, different typical values here, then we can kind of constrain a certain set of solutions to these equations. So it turns out that these observed propagating disturbances in cloudiness match up really quite well with these theoretical solutions to the shallow water equations, wave-like solutions to the shallow water equations in the tropics. So using the um, space-time uh, spectral analysis as a filter, we can extract any one of these wave solutions uh, that we're interested in. 
This one is for the MJO scales. Um, so up the top we have unfiltered OLR anomalies uh, for 2003. And down the bottom we have the OLR anomalies filtered just for the MJO scales. Um, these should be matched up in time. So you can kind of see when we see a big green blob moving across here, it matches up with a sort of patchy, messy green, green, green blob moving across in the unfiltered one. Because in the unfiltered one, there's of course the influence of all the other time scales going on at the same time. And we can do this for any time scale we want. So these are the three kind of main regions of spectral energy in this space-time spectrum. So this one, the MJO, here the Kelvin waves and here the equatorial Rosby waves. Um, so filtered for the three different time scales. So you can see we've got the two eastward moving ones uh, in here. The Kelvin wave ones are much smaller and moving faster. Um, and then we've got the westward moving equatorial Rosby waves. So here's three climate modes of variability. And it's already really complicated, right? They're all, these are all happening at the same time, right? So if you're at one location, if you're like sitting here in the northern tip of Cape York, for example, watching the OLR going up and down, you're going to be getting influences from at least these three modes of variability. And that's before we even start thinking about ENSO and the IOD and, and the IPO and, and all sorts of other modes of variability that are going on at the same time. This is way too confusing and multidimensional and we can't handle it because we're humans and it's making our brains explode. So let's make a climate index. That would be much easier. It would just be a number and we don't need to worry about all this confusing stuff. All right, so a climate index is a single number or a vector maybe if you're lucky um, that describes the phase and amplitude of a climate mode. So that's that's what we do, right? Like that's how we handle this complexity uh, in, in the atmosphere. All right, we're going to have a quick wake up moment here. Okay, hands up who works with some aspect of ENSO in your work? Okay, in fact, stand up if you work with some aspect of ENSO in your work. All right. <laughs> All right, that's pretty good. And okay, and now you can sit down and stand up if you work with some sort of faster mode of climate variability than ENSO. So like equatorial waves, MJOs, SAM. All right, people who work with both, you can choose. All right, very good. Okay, so now I'd like the ENSO people to get look at your watch and I want you to bob up and down, stand up and down every eight, nine, or 10 seconds. All right, and when I say go. And the, M, and the faster people, the MJO, Sam, and Equatorial Rosby Way people, you're gonna bob up and down about every second, but not exactly every second. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, don't, don't like injure yourself. All right, so, okay, ready, set, go. Um, that's that's one wavelength. So you you, you start. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Where's the fast people? Did they all get exhausted? <laughs> we, we filtered you out. <laughs> all right. I think that was a fair representation of the global climate system. It's <laughs> chaotic, right? It's like really hard to separate. Um, thanks, everyone. Um, thanks particularly to the fast people. I thought you did a great job. Um, so how do we make climate indices? Well, there's lots of different ways that humans have tried to organise the variability in the climate system into these nice lists of numbers that we can go and download and make composites with. Um, so here's some examples. So the Nino 3.4 index is 
the average SST anomaly over a defined region of the Pacific Ocean with some smoothing or, or running mean applied. So it is like it is just the actual anomaly. All right. So then we've got a bunch of climate indices which I've called them empirical calculations based on physical reasoning, right? There's a whole lot of climate indices which are based on the difference of something, right? So we've got the SAM index, um, and SAM talks about the, the movement of the subtropical ridge to the, to the south in, of, of Australia. Um, and so it's the pressure difference between 40 south and 65 south. The IOD, DMI index, so this is the Indian Ocean Dipole, is the anomalous sea surface temperature difference between the Western Equatorial Indian Ocean and the Southeast Equatorial Indian Ocean. The ENSO SOI index, so the original ENSO index, is the pressure difference between Tahiti and Darwin. And the IPO index, the Interdecadal Pacific Oscillation Index, is the difference between the average SST in the Central Equatorial Pacific Ocean and the average SST in the North and Southwestern Pacific Ocean, right? So they're all kind of, they're all different, but they're all kind of a gradient of something. Um, then we have indices that are based on empirical orthogonal functions. So this is where we make a basis function, and then we look at basically the, the, the time series or the amplitudes of the two basis values to make our index. And the MJO-RMM index is a good example of this, where it's based on the principal components of the two leading EOFs of OLR and uh, wind near the surface and, and high in the atmosphere over the tropical belt. I think there's other ways of making climate indices as well, but all of the ones I looked at, I could kind of slot into these three categories. And it did make me think, are these the best ways of defining climate indices, or is this just the way we've already do always done it? And what's the kind of... Can we unify all this a bit, right? This, this feels like a very piecemeal approach to different phenomena and different, different types of indices for different, different purposes. This is just, just to, just to um, explain that, the, the, for those who are not familiar, that the we, we define ENSO because ENSO is based on the warming and cooling of the Eastern Pacific Ocean. So we have these different indices um, that track the, the, temp, the SST anomalies uh, in the... Um, in the Pacific Ocean, which just gives us a very direct representation of what ENSO is doing. So there's heaps of these indices, right? These are the ones from the IPCC um, AR5 Working Group 1 report. Um, and we've got all our familiar ones that we sort of work with quite a lot. ENSO, the IPO, um, the MJO, the QBO, but there's SAM, um, but there's, there's a lot more as well, right? And it's like, it's a bewildering number and I would say a growing number, right? Because people are always discovering more kind of modes of variability which may be sort of subclasses or combinations of, of other things that, that we already know about. So let's talk a bit about weather. Um, we really like making composites, right? Like there's probably a gazillion papers out there where someone downloaded their climate index and then composited rainfall or drought or whatever according to the values of that climate index. And that's a really useful, good thing to do. Like I've done that, we've, we've, we've all done that, right? And not all of us, but many, many of us have done that. And it's, it's useful, right? Um, because it gives us a sort of statistical idea of how, how frequently that thing happens. And we do have ways of getting inside weather by doing that. So if, if instead of compositing, for example, mean rainfall, we might composite frequency of events over 50 mils, right? So it gives us a sense of like how often do we get a certain type of weather happening. But I think in general, our large scale composite patterns are not really the weather. They're not really telling us the sort of day to day variability that, that we see within that uh, kind of composite. Um, even if we're looking at something like frequency of rainfall above 50 mils, um, it doesn't really tell us whether all those days are bunched together or whether they're sort of spread out every once a week through the, through the, through the data and, and, and this kind of thing. When we look at the impacts of modes of climate variability on weather, we also have, I think, two broad classes of influences. One is the direct influence where the 
you're really close to where the actual disturbance is happening, right? Like if you're living on the uh, west coast of South America, right where that region, region of cooling and warming SSTs is to do with ENSO, that's a very direct influence of, of ENSO. Um, if you're um, sitting in Darwin and the MJO, the big convective envelope of the MJO cloudiness moves over you and causes a lot of rain, then that's also a very direct influence of the MJO. But then what we really often and typically see is these indirect influences where locations that are geographically apparently really far removed from the actual disturbance, but we still see a weather response to the disturbance. And this is what some people would call the teleconnection of the climate modes. And a good example is this um, figure that you've all seen from the BOM website, looking at the winter spring mean rainfall deciles for ENSO. We're really pretty far away from the Pacific Ocean um, and certainly away from the Eastern Pacific by the time we're down in Tasmania, uh, but we still see a strong, a reasonably strong rainfall response uh, to ENSO. And that's where the disturbance itself kind of sets off a chain reaction. It's sort of, you know, there's, it influences the weather patterns in, in a far removed area. So we can see lots of different climate modes strongly impacting on the weather in Australia. And these are just some of them. So, and I'm going to focus on rainfall here, but I could have focused on, I could have focused on maximum temperatures or drought or frost days or, or whatever, and we would have seen the same kind of, same kind of thing like with some variations. So this is ENSO again. So this is from RISB at L. 2009 paper, and this is looking at the correlation between the Southern Oscillation Index, which is ENSO, um, and rainfall uh, uh, from um, the four seasons of the year. And so we see these fairly strong correlations in different seasons, and in general we see these wetter conditions during La Nina years. And we know that ENSO, as we saw before, is varying on that sort of two to eight year kind of time scale. Oh. Something's happened to that figure. Sorry, Fadil. Didn't used to look like that. This is a beautiful figure from Fadil, which is a, uh, um, a paper that's under review. And I don't know what happened to the blurriness of the figure. It looked fine last time I looked at it. Um, but this looks at the um, rainfall response to equatorial Rosby waves um, uh, as, as they propagate uh, through the tropics and the rainfall response um, in Australia. So again, looking at that teleconnection, this is, this is having a response going really quite far south relative to where the actual disturbance is. In these plots, blue means uh, wet and red means dry. So it's actually um, times more likely to, uh, relative to, to, times more likely to exceed 90th percentile rainfall relative to the seasonal uh, average. So we're kind of used to looking at things that move from uh, west to east. But these disturbances move interestingly from east to west, right? So we've got um, here's the beginning of the disturbance, and it's moving uh, with each successive sort of position of the disturbance towards the west uh, of Australia, um, and we can see that we've got values of up to sort of around two times more likely to exceed 90th percentile rainfall um, than the seasonal uh, average. Uh, so this is like quite quite a strong rainfall response of these disturbances. This is a figure from uh, Dal Lan's paper. Some of you may know she's a PhD student at Melbourne. Um, and this result, there's also similar results in a few other papers looking at the increased likelihood of exceeding uh, 67th and 90th percentile rainfall uh, with the phases of the MJO. Um, so this is 67th percentile here and 90th percentile here. And we can see this quite, uh, and this is just showing the statistically significant values, we can see like, quite strong rainfall responses um, as the disturbance moves uh, across um, Australia up to maybe 1.6, possibly up to two times uh, more likely to exceed the 67th or 90th percentile. Rainfall. So again, quite a strong rainfall signal. 
Okay, here's another one. Here's Sam, right? So again, we're looking at the um, uh, likelihood of exceeding the 90th percentile uh, rainfall. Um, and this is from a paper by Hendon et al, 2007. So Sam is characterising the uh, northward and southward movement of the subtropical ridge. And so when we've got this more uh, northward movement, then we've got more likelihood of the storm tracks uh, impinging on uh, southern Australia. And so again, we've got like quite strong rainfall signals impacting the southern part of Australia. All right, I could go on. We could find papers about more climate indices as well, and we could they'd all have some impact of like how likely does this climate index make it to exceed median rainfall in Australia, or how likely is it to get extreme rainfall under this climate mode. And so the real complexity of this is that all of these things are happening at the same time. And they're happening on similar timescales, right? So Sam is changing every sort of weeks to month or two. I'm not really a Sam expert, but I think that's the kind of main timescale of Sam. And, and that those it's not like we can really pull these things apart in time really conclusively often from each other. Okay, what happens when we get more than one mode of variability happening at the same time? Two things can happen, well probably lots of things can happen, but the two things that I'm going to talk about here um, is that one, they can affect each other dynamically, so they can actually kind of change the structure of the, the modes themselves can change in their structure. Or the modes can stay exactly the same, but they can reinforce or suppress their impact on the weather. Right? So there's either the kind of weather impact of having more than one mode at once or the impact on the actual modes. So I'm just going to look briefly at an example of both of these possibilities. Um, so this is a paper by Wei and Ren in 2019 where they looked at how the MJO propagates under different ENSO phases. So I'm going to call this a downscale climate interaction because it's how does ENSO, which is big, impact the MJO, which is smaller, right? So we're going from big scales down to smaller scales. And they found a very different propagation pattern and speed of the MJO. So this is the Hofmuller plot of the composite MJO event under El Nino than La Nina. They found that under El Nino, the MJO goes further um, and also propagates faster than under La Nina, where it tends to stall and propagate at a slower speed. So this is really interesting, right? Like this is not just the MJO made different rainfall under different ENSO phases. It was that the MJO itself was different under different ENSO phases. And then they even looked at different flavours of ENSO and found even different propagation patterns of the MJO under different flavours of ENSO. I really like this little plot here because it comes back to the spectral analysis that I was talking about earlier in this lecture. So they calculated the power spectrum at each longitude um, and then kind of lined them all up together to make a heat map. So this is the kind of, if you sort of look across from this plot, you'll see a power spectrum, right? And this is their spectral peak of the MJO here. And what they found is that both the spectral peak occurred at a longer period under El Nino, and also that it peaked at different longitudes. With El, the spectral peak sort of peaks over here at much further east than over here under the La Nina conditions. Um, so they, they discuss a lot about the different mechanisms that might cause the MJO to behave differently under the different ENSO phases and I think this is something that we really don't understand yet. Um, but they discuss the stronger um, suppressed phase of the MJO um, ahead, ahead under El Nino conditions um, causing more kind of convergence into that suppressed phase, a stronger pressure gradient, 